Welcome to St Mary's Chalcombe. I'm Andrew Alfomenko. I'm the curate here and priest um, for here at St Mary's and also at St Stephen's Lansdowne, both on the northern slopes of Bath. And it's a pleasure and privilege to be with you for this informal service of worship, featuring the readings for the day, a sermon and some prayers. I wonder how you're feeling today whether you've been able to find relaxation, excitement and replenishment of energy over these past summer months that have extended with the recent heat waves that we've been experiencing. For many of us, many of you, especially those of you studying, working or connected to education, this feels like the beginning of a new year. The minds are set to the new academic year ahead of us, to what that year will entail and bring. The very thought of it, the shortening hours of daylight and the lengthening hours of study can be enough to tire us out and wipe out the blessings of the past summer of long days and less work, I hope. But whilst our minds may turn to what is to come, our minds also need to return to what has been, to the joy that we've found or been reminded of during these summer months that we've hopefully each been blessed with. Those memories can fuel us up, fire us up, light us through the weeks, months and years to come. So when the thought of things to come, to be done, your task list, any exams that you may have facing you this year, when those weigh heavy on you, whether even the shorter nights weigh heavy on you, I pray that you'll remember the joy that the summer has brought these past few months and know that that joy is on the horizon once again in the future. But I pray that this autumn that is ahead of us will be full of many blessings as we work our way through to Advent and the celebration that is to come. But today we are going to be celebrating the beauty of this place, but the beauty of our connection with the past. We're going to return to some ancient memories to which we are all connected. The memories, those memories can connect us not only to each other, but to people before us and after us. But before we connect with those memories. Let's remember that our Lord Jesus Christ said to remember and enact that the first commandment is that we should hear the O Israel, the Lord our God is the only Lord. You should love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind and with all your strength. And the second is this. Love your neighbour in the same manner that you love yourself. There is no other commandments greater than these. And I pray, with a prayer written for this day, one that links our readings together, that the Lord of the living waters save us from the flood of violence and despair. Reach out to us when faith is weak, when we're going under, and make us unafraid to walk with you, through Jesus Christ, in whom we are raised. Amen. The focus of this week is on a reading from the book of Exodus. So we're going to hear the Gospel message for today. Itself a message and a sermon in its own right. A beauty, a gem of, of scripture which we can subscribe to. Links to all the readings you'll find in the description below, as well you'll find links to a few other things from this service. So let's read here the Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Matthew. <coughs> Excuse me. Well, Jesus spoke to his disciples he said, if another member of the church sins against you, 
Go and point out the fault when you two of you are alone. If the member listens to you, you've regained that one. But if you are not listened to, take one or two others along with you, so that every word may be confirmed by the evidence of two or three witnesses. If the member refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if the offender refuses to listen even to the church, let such a one be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. Truly I tell you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Again, truly I tell you, if two, or, if two of you agree on earth about anything you ask, it will be done for you by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered in my name, I am there among them. That's such a beautiful piece of scripture with so much in it. And I'm sure you'll recognise certain verses which are often used, taken out of the context of that particular passage and used in other contexts, such as where two or three are gathered in my name, I am there among them. And whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. That's often featured in weddings. Well, our second reading is, as I said, from the book of Exodus. And it's where the first Passover is instigated. If you've been following our sermons recently, over the summer we've been working through the book of Genesis and we're into the book of Exodus. At this point in the Exodus story of the Israelites, God has sent the various plagues on Egypt in an attempt to persuade the Pharaoh that he needs to let the Israelites go, to free them from the oppression and slavery. And then we get to this piece of scripture. So it's chapter 12, verses 1 to 14. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, This month shall mark for you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year for you. A new year. Tell the whole congregation of Israel that on the 10th of this month they are to take a lamb for each family, a lamb for each household. If a household is too small for a whole lamb, it shall join its closest neighbour in obtaining one. The lamb shall be divided in proportion to the number of people who eat it. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a year old male. You may take it from the sheep or from the goats. You should keep it until the 14th day of this month, and then the whole assembled congregation of Israel shall slaughter it at twilight. They shall take some blood from it and put it on the doorposts and lintels of the houses in which they eat. They shall eat the lamb that same night, and they shall eat it, eat it roasted over the fire which un with unleavened bread and bitter herbs. Do not eat of it any of it raw or boiled in water, but roasted over the fire with its heads, legs and inner organs. You shall let none of it remain until the morning. Anything that remains until the morning you shall burn. This is how you shall eat it. Your loins girded, your sandals on your feet, your staff in your hand, and you shall eat it hurriedly. It is the Passover of the Lord. For I will pass through the land of Egypt that night, and I will strike down every firstborn in the land of Egypt, both human beings and animals. On all the gods of Egypt I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. The blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you live. When I see the blood, I will pass over you, and no plague shall destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. This day shall be a day of remembrance for you. You shall celebrate it as a festival to the Lord throughout your generations. You shall observe it as a perpetual ordinance. 
This is the word of the Lord. Praise to you, O God. <coughs> well, as I said, it's an informal service, so if, like me, you've got a cup of tea, coffee, feel free to dip into it. Mm. Nice bit of lap sang sushi. Well, before I bring you a message for today, let's pray. Lord, we thank you for the peace of this place. May it spread beyond this church, down the ethernet cables, into the homes. May we be connected through our screens to each other and to you. And may the words that I speak be the words that you want me to speak. And may the words that are heard be the words that you want me to want to be heard. I ask this in the precious name of our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, among our readings, the importance of connection to each other and to the past is there. It not only reminds us, we're not only reminded what fuels us, but who fuels us. And that's community. Communities of faith, memory and identity. Communities of provision, inclusion and grace. And communities of hope, protection and rescue. In the reading from Exodus, we heard about the preparations for a feast that would bring protection. It was and would forever be remembered as the Passover. A feast taking place following a series of plagues on the land of Egypt to try and persuade the Pharaoh to let God's people go. of Willard White singing the famous Negro spiritual song, Go Down Moses. There's a clip to the full version in the description below. So God sent the plagues, but Pharaoh didn't let them go. Moses' faith and God's power seemingly not persuaded Egypt's ruler that he and his gods were not all that he thought them to be. I say seemingly because I can't help but wonder if Pharaoh had realised the fallacy of his gods. There were signs in his speeches to Moses that after the plagues reveal that they were having an effect, an impact on him, even if they weren't enabling him to see the reality behind the illusion on which his power rested. The fear of losing it all can turn people to denial and to desperate measures. Fear can harden hearts and close minds. Fear can hide humility and acceptance. Fear can drive people into futile and fatal actions. Words and plagues had failed to free Israel from the oppression and slavery. Now it had come to this, the killing 
of the firstborn of Egypt. again. Why such an act of violence by God and killing so many defenceless children? Yes, they were children of the oppressor. Yes, they would have been brought up to continue with their power, privilege and oppression. Yes, but I can't help but wonder if even one of those children would have grown up to see the oppressive empire for what it was and bring it down from within. Such a question may not always be answered by the past, but we must hope for it to be answered in the parallels of the present, such as in Russia and Iran, to name but two. This moment in the history of Israel, of Judaism, and indeed by virtue of Jesus, of Christianity itself, is one of those moments where the surface reading is at least unpalatable, even stomach churning and faith shaking to hear. Sometimes even the justification or the reasoning doesn't sweeten the bitterness of the taste of the bitter herbs that they would be eating with their bread. But it's in the wrestling with the difficulties of our past, not the denial of them, that we must find that we find healing and hope for the future. We've seen efforts to do and achieve just that with our countries and cities' own connection with oppression and slavery, though there is much more wrestling and reckoning needed to be done. Israel were God's chosen people to speak and demonstrate the world through. They were God's firstborn, acting as such before the birth of his firstborn, his only born son. Protecting them, enabling their survival, facilitating their freedom was and is an understandable motivation, even if the measures taken are sometimes hard to stomach. Israel were living in dark times, but the darkest moment is the moment before the dawn, because freedom was about to rise like the sun over the horizon. They had a future. The heavy cost of their freedom under their protection being realised was being made clear to them and to us in our reading from Exodus, when God spoke of them enacting something that they were to reenact in the future. The unleavened bread would remind them of the bread that they had baked in a hurry. The imminent rescue, not giving enough time for yeasted bread to rise. The lamb they would eat would remind them of life given for their life. Its blood giving life, not through its veins, but through the doorposts and lintels that it marked. This hurried bread and spilt blood, a sign that they were God's people saved to live for free. Within the darkness of this passage, there is light and love, not just in God's promise of and commitment to Israel's salvation from oppression. There was community of provision, inclusion and grace. Those without the means to obtain a lamb were to be included by those who did. No one from this community of faith was to be excluded. Everyone would have access to the lamb and the protection and salvation that it would bring. This moment became part of Israel's identity and it is part of ours too. When we prepare for and receive Holy Communion, we are reenacting the first Passover meal because Jesus reenacted the first Passover meal 
ahead of him becoming the sacrificial lamb. When he sat down during the Passover festival, it was his last supper. He spoke of his blood, shed not onto lintels, but onto the cross. Blood which would give life. Now both Jews and Gentiles would be marked for salvation from the slavery to sin and the oppression of death. When we speak and hear the words of the Eucharist, when we eat the bread and sip the wine, we are connecting with and sharing in a community's identity and life throughout time. We too share in the protection of spilt blood, but unlike the temporary rescue of the Exodus, the rescue given by the blood spilt by Jesus was and is permanent. The invitation Jesus gave was not to a Passover feast, but to a heavenly banquet. It tastes not of bitter herbs, but of sweet wine. The cost of keeping Israel became too much for Pharaoh. He let people, God's people go. Yet even as he did, he still held on to the belief and power and his ability to rule over, oppress and obliterate them. He was unable to accept reality, unable to admit defeat, unable to back down. He pursued them to the end, his end. Imagine what would have happened if those who lived within the privilege of Pharaoh's regime had seen the wrong in their comfort. Imagine if they had not just questioned it, but risen up against it. Such a rising carries a cost, and it always isn't successful as those who rose up against Hitler found, but often hurry up the rescue. Imagine what would have happened if Pharaoh had had the humility to have accepted the error of his ways. Imagine how many lives would have been saved if he had seen and accepted the reality of his oppression and failures before the parted waves of the Red Sea were joined together. There are people living under oppressors, despots and dictators today. There are people whose innocence and innocence are being sacrificed. There are people crying out to be rescued. May we know of them identify with them and pray for them. Amen. Well, we've come to a time of prayer. And our prayers this week have been written by John Pritchard, a former Bishop of Oxford. The response he's written to the words, if the Son shall set us free, is we shall be free indeed. If the Son shall set us free, we shall be free indeed. So, in peace. Let's pray to Jesus our Lord, who ever lives, to make intercession for us. Life-giving God, one of your most characteristic actions is to set people free. As you freed your people from Egypt, from Babylon and finally on the cross, from everything that would destroy us. So we ask you to set your church free in this age from divisions, rivalries and obsessions that put us back in chains. So we ask you to save us from ourselves in our arguments over sexuality, inclusion, 
scripture, church unity, many females ordained, whatever our arguments, Lord, we ask you to save us from them. Give us the deep security that enables us to give each other the freedom to be different. If the Son shall set us free, we shall be free indeed. Life-giving God, one of your most characteristic actions is to give people hope. There's a wonderful roll call of those who, with invincible hope, fought for freedom without using violence. Wilberforce, Bonhoeffer, Gandhi, Martin Luther King, Junior, many people in Eastern Europe. But still, the people of your world are suffering the terrible imprisonments of political systems, debt, hunger, torture, and so much more. We pray earnestly for people imprisoned in Iran and Russia and so many places. We pray for those seeking survival and justice amidst warfare in Ukraine, Syria, Yemen, the Congo, Sudan, too many places, Lord. Let them know that where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. If the Son shall set us free, we shall be free indeed. Life-giving God, one of your most characteristic actions is to give us personal freedom. We're addicted to so many things in our society, drugs, television, shopping, obsession with our size and shape. Above all, we're addicted to do things our own way. And so resisting your loving purpose for us. We live lives of functional atheism and you long to release us into the freedom of Christ. Help us to live lives of faithful joy that draw others to the one that we follow. May our lives be so freely shared that others will want to share that freedom. In silence, Lord, we offer ourselves to you for the for you to reclaim the inner citadel of our lives and make us your own. We are not our own, but yours. Put us to what you will, for if the Son shall set us free, we shall be free indeed. Life giving God Another of your most characteristic actions is to bring the freedom of healing to the sick and comfort to the bereaved. Give the assurance of your loving and healing presence to the people who are on our hearts as a community and to those known only to you. May these, your children, experience the freedom of your near presence and your healing love. If the Son shall set us free, we shall be free indeed. And as our Saviour taught us, so we pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin us sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Life-giving God, in the freedom of your Spirit, bring us and all whom we have prayed to the freedom of your kingdom and the light of everlasting day, for we ask this in the name of Jesus, our true and living Lord. Amen.
prayer. It's been really nice to worship to you, with you this week. I hope some of the peace of this beautiful place, this ancient church dating back to over a thousand years, even longer, if you can include the women, the nuns who came here in the fourth century and made this place their home. So many years connected with each other, connected with you, connected with me, connected with those yet to come. Let's end with a blessing if we may. May the peace, may you receive the peace from God our Father who hears our cry. Peace from his Son Jesus Christ whose death brings healing. And peace from the Holy Spirit whose life gives strength. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Creator, Redeemer and Guide be among you and remain with you always. Amen. For well, I pray you have a blessed week ahead, full of moments of joy, fueled also by memories that bring you joy from the past and hope for future joy too. God bless you. Goodbye.